Uh, so welcome everyone. This is our Cascadia Grains regional call. Uh, my name is Abba Kaiser and I am the project manager for the WSU Food Systems Program. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen I'm using an automatic translation through PowerPoint into Spanish. Um, we are hopeful that um, this can also uh, work for, um, uh, it's, it's not perfect, but we're hopeful that we can also um, uh, use it for the International Quinoa Research Symposium that we're going to be presenting in August. Uh, so please forgive the very, uh, very um, loose translation here. I'm also going to be doing this live stream on Facebook, uh, on our Facebook page as well, so that other folks can have access to this. Um, and I think this add a title go live here we go we'll see if that goes through there all right so I just I just want to acknowledge in this very digital time, it's important to still stay grounded in where we are. I personally am broadcasting live from uh, Port Townsend area where the Macaw, the Chimicum, and the Clallam peoples have traditionally stewarded and um, been the, the keepers of this land. This is my friend Walter McQuillan, who's the Macaw chief. Um, and he uh, is very active in the community and is very generous with his um, cultural ways. And so I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge Walter and his family. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to do a brief overview of the Cascadia Greens initiative, followed by some presentations by uh, our wonderful speakers that we have today, Blake Richard, Cedric Habiyaremie, Michelle Ojamian, and a, a video with Hallie Choi, who is not able to um, be here today, but um, we're really ex excited to be sharing a video about baking with quinoa. So. Uh, then we'll do breakout rooms uh, where you can make announcements and talk about the work that you're doing. We will be recording this. We will also be recording the chat if you want to post resources there throughout. Uh, and uh, we'll be reporting that out in a regional call newsletter next week. So please, if you have any other uh, items for the uh, regional newsletter, please send them to me by five o'clock tomorrow so that I can include them in our um, in our newsletter. Just a little bit about the program. Um, can Everyone can hear me okay? Cedric, you're doing all right? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, so Laura Lewis is my boss. She's the statewide leader of the WSU Food Systems Program. And uh, Nicole Witham is my cohort. She's the statewide coordinator. We provide specialized resources for farmers and food systems across Washington State. And one of the best ways to plug in with our team is to join the Food System COVID-19 Hub, which is Fridays at 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we report out, we collect information, there's presentations. Um, uh, I know Henry who's on the call has presented recently and um, we have a space for a lot of folks to be sharing what's going on and how to stay connected through this time. So you can register on that website there and we'll also send it out at the end of the call. So just a little bit about the conference. We were born in 2013 out of a, a, a desire to connect farmers and resource providers and processors across the uh, value chain in Western Washington. We were started by a grad student of the Bread Lab in collaboration with Pierce County Extension and Thurston County Extension. And now eight years later, it's turned into a wonderful network of people. These are some of our values. Um, flavor, cultural relevance, environmentally sound practice, domestic and local and regional markets, health and nutrition, and equitable access. So just a little bit about uh, the grains work that we do. This is a listserv that was set up um, that's to stay connected with uh, farmers in the Northwest and to opportunities for local grains. You can sign up for this listserv on our website, and I'll also send out the link after that. This is just a little plug for the International Quinoa Research Symposium that's going to be happening online. It's a free event, uh, August 17th through 19th. Cedric is gonna talk a little bit more about this event uh, in his presentation, but it's gonna be a bilingual uh, multi-day event with uh, interactive um, 
to chats and lots of ways to plug in and engage. Uh, everything is going to be translated into English and Spanish. So that's what we're working on right now. We're getting all the presentations recorded and it's really exciting to see speakers from all over the world tuning in and sharing all their knowledge and wisdom, especially the cultural keepers of quinoa in Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, and Argentina. So who's on this call? This is a, a little screen grab that we got a, a few days ago. Um, we have mostly resource providers on the call, such as myself, uh, Michelle. We have then uh, our strongest cohort uh, continues to be bakers, both professional and home bakers, uh, followed by government and state agencies, producers and farmers. And then you can see brewers, malsters, millers, distillers, um, sales, retails, advocates, um, lots of folks who uh, make up the value chain tune into these calls. Uh, King County is very represented here uh, today and uh, we're happy to see that folks from Skagit and Thurston, uh, Lewis, Callet, Spokane and Whitman are also tuning in. And with that, we're gonna move right into our wonderful speakers. Um, we're gonna kick it off with uh, Blake Richard who is in uh, Northern California. He's a farmer and he knows lots about quinoa. Uh, don't let him fool you. Uh, Blake, are you there? Can I'm you hear? Howdy. Awesome. Great. Do you want to um, just kind of give us a little intro and, and talk a little bit about your experience growing quinoa in the Northwest? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, all right. So, yeah, we're, we're down in the area of far northern California, right on the coast. And we rent land um, in several different places, some, you know, a few miles inland, but some basically right on the ocean. We just rent land. We get kind of moved around on, on dairy land for the most part. And about 15 years ago, well, we've, we've been, I've been there certified organic growing for 25 years now. Um, and, you know, we were growing about 20, 30 acres of vegetables a year is what we were doing. And about 15 years ago, we decided to start messing around with quinoa because we love to eat it and, and we knew it would be a good fit um, for the area in general. So we, you know, started messing around in a small way. And, uh, and then we found ourselves within a few years growing, you know, another, you know, 10, 15, 20 acres within a couple of years. Um, and with the, the objective of that was to sell it locally because that's what our, our market was for our vegetables. We, and, and so we, uh, so we went through a learning curve with figuring out, you know, where to get seed, how to grow it and how to process it and, um, and how to store it. And, you know, we originally got our seeds from uh, White Mountain Seeds in Colorado. And we got a mix of uh, seeds from them, some white and um, some black seed. And, um, and we grew those and uh, we grew them uh, in a way that was similar to the way White Mountain was growing, which was in rows so it could be cultivated. Spacing, you know, about a plant about every four or five inches. That was kind of what they recommended and what we started doing at that point. But uh, we, we kind of evolved with that and pretty soon we were growing in very dense rows. We still grew in rows because a, a lot of our fields had a lot of weeds. So we really did cultivate. But we found that when we grew really densely, um, you know, like five, 10 seeds an inch, literally, our rows, um, that it was way more competitive with the weeds and it matured quicker and more uniformly. And we could set the combine head just right below the head of the the seed heads and we didn't have to take in as much thick stockage and all that. So we, we started doing that and um, and then we also uh, uh, you know started messing around with uh, Frank Morton's amazing varieties that he you know that he developed there in Paloma, Oregon with wild garden seeds. And those were very very uh, uniform nice varieties. And then what happened with us was um, we, we bought a, a, a scarifier from Peru who was the first one brought into this country I guess it was specifically made to process quinoa, to scarify quinoa. It was called a Volcano from a company in Peru. And then uh, we were selling to the local stores um, and then we lumbered family farms. We started talking to them. They became aware of that we were doing it. And they came over and visited us and asked us if we wanted to grow for them. And so we started uh, increasing our acreage a lot. You know, we were a, a hokey farm and we still are. Um, and we started growing uh, a lot more uh, a lot more land and going through the curve of that. We started getting other, other people to grow with us too. Um, we had friends in the Mennonite community and we got them involved. And uh, pretty soon uh, the people growing for, lum in lum you know, for Lumberg uh, family farms in Humboldt County 
got up to about a thousand acres a year. We were growing almost 400 um, back a few years back. And uh, but then Lumberg had trouble selling enough stuff uh, quinoa, and so we uh, they 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 uh, plummeted the acreage that they wanted us to grow. And at that point, in the last couple of years, I've kind of been rethinking the whole thing, and I've gone back now to just just for the most part growing for our, our, our local community, our regional area between San Francisco and Southern Oregon, basically. Um, and uh, and we're, we're still growing, uh, you know, the original seed that we got from White Mountain, though we kind of reselected that into a rainbow. We kind of chose all the weirdest, uh, weirdest plants in that when we first started doing it and disproportionately saved those seed and turned it into a rainbow variety that we grow. But this last year, we also, so, but yeah, and that's the, the thing. If you go, if you want to grow quinoa, you know, um, for a regional area, it's kind of hard to source seed. I mean, White Mountain in Colorado will sell you seed. I guess it's a little more difficult, I think, now because I think somebody bought them out. I don't know anything about it all. But anyhow, um, Frank Morin, of course, has seed in, in Oregon, but um, not you know, large quantities um, for, for growing fields. Um, and then there's also, uh, this year, what we decided to do so we could get by um, process where we decided to go with the quinoa company in the Netherlands because they offer saponin-free varieties of quinoa. We won't have to scarify it. And um, I guess most of the growers in Europe, and there's a lot of quinoa being grown in Europe now, um, are using uh, the quinoa company's uh, saponin-free. So we're really hoping that those taste really good and that they uh, save us a lot of work because basically once we harvest those, um, they'll be ready to eat. Yeah, so we, the way we grow it um, now is, um, like I said, we grow in rows um, because we have weeds in our fields. And so we grow uh, in rows so we can cultivate and have you know, less weeds going to seed and competing. So we have grown when we're pretty sure there's not gonna be a lot of weeds, we have grown with a grain drill and that works good also. We dry farm our quinoa. You know, our soil maintains a lot of moisture and the problem really is waiting until the soil gets dry enough to get into plant. And then we you know we maintain the mulch layer, the dry mulch layer by cultivating. And so we dry farm it and cultivate. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's in our area, it becomes a little difficult sometimes in the late summer, early fall when we're trying to harvest because we have to dance around the rain. And of course, that's one of the big risks is getting a, a rain that's, uh, a long rain. Of course, you could have three inches of rain one night, and if it happens at night, it's no big deal because it would dry up the next day. But if you had several days of uh, consistent drippiness, then that could, of course, sprout the seed on the head. And so what we do uh, now, what we're starting to do is we're starting to swap, where we, um, you know, once the seed is actually mature and the plants are still green, we can go in and uh, cut it down with a swather and then wait a few days for it to dry down and then uh, pick it up with a pickup header on a combine. And um, that makes a much higher final product um, because not only are you not taking in the green leaf um, that's still on the plants, but um, any green weeds in the field, of course, you're not bringing in all that moisture into your, uh, into your quinoa seed. Um, and so, but once we harvest, you know, one of the big issues with growing, uh, for just your, you know, to save the seed yourself and to sell locally, it was drying the seed down because it's really hard to get it dry enough in our climate. Um, and probably anywhere where you guys are, it's probably a similar thing. We harvest usually at about 15% moisture with the seed. And for it to really store well, it has to be down more closer to 10%. And um, so we've got, you know, some hokey ways of drying with, you know, big that's we put them in with a false bottoms with the screen and we blow air up through it. Um, but and then with storage, we've also had issues with uh, dust mites and with um, uh, caterpillars, lar the larva. And so those are some issues that we're, we're working out. Um, the best would be to dry this, put it in plastic right away, you know, um, so that it could be protected from those things. Um, any other, can you think of anything else I should mention about our general situation? That's a great overview, Blake. And I think if anybody has questions, you can um, post them in the chat. And we have a, a, few, a few minutes here for questions for Blake, if anybody has them.
but that was that was a great overview. Anybody have any questions for Blake? I see also that, um, uh, oh, we have a question from Michelle. Do you use a pencil dryer? No, I don't even know what that is. Um, what is that? <laughs> Michelle, do you want to? Oh, okay. So yeah, I, um, we have a mill also, and we often run into problems with grain um, having just a little bit too much moisture, and we want to get stuff down to 13%. So we use those giant tote bags, and we'll put what's called a pencil dryer into the bag. It points down oh, in the yeah. bag, and it's just air. And they're fantastic. And, it's, and it isn't heating it up at all. It's just air. So that might be a, that might be a thing to do. Well, we've, we've tried those, those ones with kind of an auger welded onto the outside. You jam them down in the bags. Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. what you, yeah those, those haven't worked for us very well for some reason. Um, but maybe yeah, we're, ours, doing it on, a good we're doing it on bigger grain than quinoa. Quinoa is so tiny, but we use it on popcorn and wheat and things like that. So. We, we, uh, we, the, you know, the price, it's, it's gotten kind of hard to be competitive um, because you can buy out of country quinoa for, you know, close to a dollar a pound ready to eat, you know, the, through a distributor in, in volume, of course. And so we feel like uh, we're, we're selling for about two dollars a pound to stores directly. Mm -hmm. And the stores have been happy about that. But uh, it, we feel that that is, uh, you know, something that they might not always be happy with because it is higher price than they can get it from you know South America. Awesome. Thanks, Blake. If there are any more questions, you can feel free to continue the conversation in the chat. We're going to switch over to Cedric Habayiremie, who's going to share a little bit about the International Quinoa Research Symposium that's coming up. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can do that, Cedric. Yeah. Okay, can you see my, my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay. And I see um, people are also just, uh, introducing themselves in the in the chat, and feel free to continue the conversation there and take it away, Cedric. Uh, thank you, Ava, and uh, the Cascadia Grand Conferences organizers uh, for the opportunity. My name is Cedric Aviarimier. I am a research associate at Washington State University. I'm originally from Rwanda. And today I'll be talking about the International Kino Research Symposium uh, that we are organizing and the power of working directly with the communities to design the needs for the plant breeding work that we do. But before I go into that, I want first of all uh, introduce you or tell you about our research group called the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab. Um, we are a group of plant breeders, researchers, and graduate students. We focus on specialty crop breeding and agronomy. Uh, we are based here at Washington State University in the Department of Crop Sci and Soil Sciences. Our goal is to increase the genetic and biodiversity of cropping systems across Washington State through the development of new cultivars and implementation of ecologically rooted production practices. Uh, internationally, we conduct participatory breeding and agronomic research on quinoa, barley, and millet in Rwanda, Malawi, Kenya, and Ecuador. We also collaborate with the researchers in other countries, such as like in countries in Europe, Australia, as well, Middle East, and uh, other countries in Latin America that includes Chile, Chile and Bolivia. Uh, our research group focuses on 
crop breeding system research in mostly these crops that you see on the screen um, quinoa, barley, spelt, buckwheat, perennial grains, and processed millet. We emphasize on crop of varieties and farming system that optimize uh, nutritional value and provide tolerance to heat, drought, disease, while improving yield, flavor, and end use quality. Uh, our cropping system research has included studies on intercropping, cover crops, crop rotation effects, uh, no-till farming, crop livestock integration, and optimal planting with nitrogen and irrigation and seeding rates. However, in our work, we emphasize uh, more on um, the value of engaging farmers through the breeding process. Uh, both, both local farmers in the Pacific Northwest and internationally where we work, they inspire our research project and our supporters and funders, they fuel uh, our pursuit and adapting, adapting novel crops uh, to our region and developing new functional threats, uh, threats for stable grains. In the lab, we study our crop down to the molecular level and, and in the field we, we partner with farmers throughout the Pacific Northwest and other parts of the world to conduct a variety of agronomic and breeding uh, trials uh, in their lands. Uh, the strength of our breeding programs come from melding of, of farmer and researcher knowledge. We value our relationship with the farmers and it is in the DNA of our work. So among many crops uh, we focus on in our research, like I mentioned them above, uh, today I want to focus more on quinoa. Uh, Blake did a good job of talking about his uh, work in quinoa. Uh, and uh, I'd like to add that. Uh, sorry, OK. As you can see, I'm not going to talk more in the details of what you see, more information are available on the screen. But uh, among, among those crops we work with, uh, this crop, quinoa, is the crop that we have a lot of research going on in the Pacific Northwest and in other, part, other parts, different parts of the world, including Africa, in countries like Rwanda, where I am from, Malawi and Kenya. Latin America, like Ecuador, Chile, and Bolivia, and also in Europe, Australia, and the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia. Uh, so uh, I joined the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab in August 2013. And at uh, that time, I was uh, studying graduate school. And I remember the research on quinoa was very new. In fact, I arrived when they were hosting the first International Quinoa Research Symposium. Uh, and this is one of uh, the biggest memories of my arrival at Washington State University uh, at the, as a student that time. Uh, and I remember stories from my colleague and friend, Dr. Kevin Murphy. Some of you uh, may know him. Uh, he was telling me that when they started Quinoa Research in the Pacific Northwest around, it was back in 2010, that's when they initially started. People would laugh at them because nobody knew what it was. However, since the first International Quinoa Research Symposium seven years ago, uh, the production of quinoa has expanded worldwide. It is becoming a household world. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we have an estimate of um, farmers raising quinoa on around 3,000 to 5,000 acres with the Southeast Idaho, uh, the host spot we have. And this year, because um, 
after realizing how you know research is taking traction and the potential quinoa has this year we are together with the Washington State University Food Systems Program, we are organizing the second International Quinoa Research uh, Symposium. That will be on August uh, 17 through 19. And the registration is open and it's free. It's a free event. Uh, so far, I think uh, around almost or around 700 people have already signed up and we hope to draw uh, around 1,000 participants. So. Those of you who are here listening now, if you have not registered yet, please do because you don't want to miss this, uh, this opportunity. Uh, the symposium will include recorded keynote speakers, field work interaction, poster sessions, and online discussion forums, focusing on quinoa related topics such as ancestral knowledge, genetic resources, uh, and the world relatives, field and post-harvest phenotyping and more. And the objective of this symposium is to focus world attention on the role that quinoa plays in contributing to the food security and human health and the nutrition. And, so, and then also the sustainable production and holistic use worldwide. Uh, and this event presents a valuable and unique opportunity to network, engage, and collaborate with fellow quinoa enthusiasts on the international stage. Uh, and during the symposium, uh, farmers, they will learn about quinoa production, connect with scare appropriate buyers, and learn strateg strategies for increasing demand. And processors will get an inside look into quinoa production, quality, brokering relationships. And I think, uh, like Blake, like Blake said, that Blake, you better sign up if you haven't already, because it sounds like you already have. Uh, you want to make those kind of connections. So this will be a good opportunity for you and some other people who are interested. And the local government official will learn about rising investment and the policy opportunities. And the scientists and the researcher will share cutting edge findings and identifying, they will identify gaps in knowledge and establish working relationship to advance quinoa research and the development. Uh, moreover, I encourage you all who are listening to register as soon as possible. Um, the deadline for registration is August 10. And I would love to see you there. You can find more information on this uh, screen. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thanks, Cedric. I just posted the website also in the chat um, for those of you who want to sign up. Uh, the registration is open until August 10th, as Cedric said. Uh, he's going to be presenting along with almost 50, uh, 53 speakers at this point from all over the world. So. Uh, please join us and please help spread the word. Is there, are there any questions for Cedric and about the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab, his work, or um, the Quinoa Symposium before we move on to Michelle Ajamian? You can post them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Okay, great. Well, if you have any questions, you can um, contact uh, uh, Cedric. Uh, if you, uh, Cedric, do you want to post your, your email in the chat box when you stop sharing and then yes. can contact you? Yeah, I will share my email in the chat box. Awesome. Okay. All right, let's go to Michelle. Do you want to just give a, a brief introduction and talk a little bit about the work that you're doing? Yes. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, well, let's see. My introduction is I'm Michelle Ajanian. I live in Appalachia, Ohio. I've lived here for over 20 years. And about 10 years ago, I got involved with staple grains, having done some food system work prior to that, been a farmer, etc. 
Um, so we started out kind of, uh, my partner says it was existential anxiety um, because there's there was the lo burgeoning local food, food movement 10 years ago, but where were staple grains and beans coming from? Uh, we ate a lot of those, uh, including, uh, we don't just say grains because we really want to emphasize that staple, staple seed crops are much more than grains. For example, quinoa. Um, so we uh, got a small grant from SARE um, for our region, and we did test plots of a number of high-nutrition staples, including quinoa, and that, I was talking about that before we started, and how our quinoa grew very large, but it was just too humid here for the seed to ripen um, without pathogens attacking it. So I want to learn more about how it's grown in the Pacific Northwest. So um, out of that work, Starting those test plots, we um, looked at what would it take to have a regional-based staple food system in Appalachia, and we thought um, kind of romantically that we were going to become farmers of staple grains instead of veggies, and we in short time realized that Ohio happens to have a lot of people who know how to grow these crops and have the equipment to do it, but the missing link is processing. So we started a mill and um, that mill has been going for about 10 years and I could talk a little bit about that, but I kind of want to jump to um, what we're doing now and that is I'm working with a nonprofit organization here called Rural Action and our project is called the Appalachian Staple Foods Collaborative and part of that project is to um, actually network with within our region, but with other regions, countries. So we've started a North American staple foods network to bring in leaders from other regions who are looking at how to grow and process these crops um, and the research on these crops, particularly bringing back land race varieties and doing experiments with things that maybe you think don't grow where you live. Um, we've done a lot with black beans and pinto beans in Ohio, which pretty much were not grown here before we started this. And um, at the mill, our second largest uh, market is for black beans. So um, overall, um, why would anybody do this? And you guys probably all know why, but I'll just say a few sentences about that. Um, staple seed crops, um, when we think about them in the global market, people are thinking about corn and soy primarily, and um, they are the lion's share of agriculture worldwide. They always have been in terms of a nutrition source, but now, um, well, since the 70s or 60s, they've become kind of, may I say, a military uh, mm, tool because um, by controlling world markets, around these crops, we change the cuisine of people worldwide. Um, they, other countries can't subsidize their farmers the way we subsidize ours, so our food winds up being cheaper. People in parts of Africa who, for many, many years, uh, for example, ate millet because it's appropriate for their climate, now eat corn because their farmers can't compete with U.S. GMO corn. Um, that's why it's important, everybody. You know, we need to do something regional. We need to look at nutrition. We need to look at soil health. And we need to look at cultural cuisine. And all of these things are really hit with staple seed crops. So that's what we're up to. And I hope you'll join us. Um, I have no ability to put anything in the chat because I'm using my phone. And I'll just, you'll see my hands all over the screen. But um, I'll send out some information on how to get in touch with me, and I really do hope um, you all get in touch with me about uh, more about the work we're doing here. And uh, maybe you'll join our, our groups. We do a monthly call with our steering committee and a quarterly call for everybody else. So get in touch, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thanks, Michelle. Does anybody have any questions that they want to post in the chat? I can read them off here. Mm. 
Okay, I don't see anyone popping up quite yet, so I'm going to move on. But Michelle, please send me uh, the info that you want uh, to be published, and I can put it in our um, news, our regional newsletter that goes out to everybody. And thanks so much for all the work that you do. Yeah, thank you. Bye. All right, we're going to go into a video now with um, Hallie Choi, who is a PhD student with the U of I WSU School of Food Science. Um, Hallie did a lot of work with practical applications of quinoa in baking, so you'll hear her talk a little bit about that. And Hallie has been an active um, uh, steering committee member and speaker of the Cascadia Grains Network in the past. Uh, she has presented at the Cascadia Grains Conference, the Cascadia Grains East Pilot Conference, and the Inland Northwest Artisan Grains Conference, uh, among other uh, exciting uh, opportunities that she's had the chance to present um, her knowledge base in. And this is just a quick video that she sent us about uh, baking with quinoa, so I'd just like to play it now. It's about five minutes long, and after this we'll go into our discussion groups where you can make an announcement um, that you, uh, an and that, that will be shared out on our regional call list. So. Thank you, Abba, for that introduction. As stated, my name is Hallie Choi, and I'm presenting on some quick tips for baking with quinoa. So far, I have blended whole seed quinoa flour with refined wheat flour and sandwich breads at up to 25% quinoa, hearth breads at up to 50% quinoa, and pancakes at up to 100% quinoa. I will break my comments today into two main sections. First, I will discuss the physical aspects of working with whole seed quinoa flour, such as how dough handling may be different. Then I will discuss consumer responses to the appearance, flavors, and aromas in the quinoa wheat blended baked goods. For the physical aspects in the sandwich and hearth breads, I did not notice any changes in dough integrity that would suggest I adjust the dough mixing time anywhere between 5 and 50% quinoa flour replacement. So mixing time may not need large adjustments, though you will likely need to add extra water. And you should give a good five minutes or so for the water to be absorbed before you begin mixing. The pre-shaping and shaping of the doughs became more a more difficult process as quinoa flour was increased. The dough could not be pulled as tight during pre-shaping as a normal wheat loaf because the dough would begin to tear. As quinoa flour replacement increased, the dough would more frequently stick to the counter surface and tear during shaping as well. Increases in quinoa flour resulted in heavier final loaves because the fiber in the quinoa flour was holding on to more of that water. Um, and then for the pancakes, increased quinoa flour led to increased viscosity of batter and thicker pancakes. Simply adding more liquid could solve the problem of thicker pancakes, but it wouldn't stop them from crumbling, which was our other problem with the pancakes. At up to 80% quinoa flour with 20% refined wheat, the pancakes could still hold together without an outside binding agent. But if you do want to make pancakes that are 100% quinoa flour, and I would highly recommend using a binder to help hold the pancakes together. Whole eggs worked well in my experience. If you are trying to make the pancakes vegan, then you can test chia seeds, sorghum flour, or almond flour, or whatever your favorite go-to binding agent is. Now for the sensory aspects. Whole seed quinoa flour can add beautiful colors to your baked goods, as well as delicious aromas and flavors. The two varieties analyzed here were antique white and tricolor, and it's pretty easy to spot the visual differences between the two and the 50% quinoa flour hearth breads that I'm showing you here. A lot of the consumers who encountered both were really wowed by the speckled and purplish appearance of the tricolor. The Nutty aromas and flavors were viewed positively by consumers and were occasionally compared to the taste of peanut butter, though personally, I think the nutty flavor tastes more like sesame to me. 
Some varieties of quinoa have stronger bitter flavors, in which case the quinoa flour will be better suited to savory products like the hearth breads and sandwich breads rather than the pancakes. The sweeter quinoa variety tested here, the antique white, worked well in all three products. Even after working with only two varieties of quinoa, I noticed diverse flavor profiles and opportunities for pairings. So I have to recommend taste testing whatever quinoa baked goods you come across before assuming what would work well with them. I know that will be a hardship since no one involved with the Cascadia Greens team could possibly like taste testing, but I'm sure you are all capable of enduring it. So with that, thank you all for listening. If you have any follow-up questions, you can contact me with the email listed at the bottom of the screen, Hallie Choi or Hallie.choi at wsu.edu. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your quinoa studies today. Awesome. And we'll be posting that video as well uh, after the call. So we're going to move swiftly into these announcement groups. We have about 10 minutes uh, to do this. Uh, we don't have that many folks on the call, so I think we'll be able to do it if we split up into two groups. So in just a moment, I will give you a prompt to join one of two breakout rooms. Um, this is an announcement time for you to share what's going on in your world. It doesn't have to be quinoa related, um, but just an introduction even to who you are and what you do is, uh, is great. Um, it's just a chance for you to get, um, to get to know the other folks on the call. We'll come back together at five minutes to the hour. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can go into breakout rooms here.